Well, how do you thank somebody sufficiently for saving your life? What do you say? A kind of gratitude that it's hard to imagine. I passed all the criteria and had my medical and everything and I was paid my first day's pay, two shillings. And uh, that was it, I was in. My mother wanted a photograph of me and my hair, I had long hair then, it was wet through and the photographer and I pinned it up as best we could in a sort of big whirl at the front here and tucked it up um, above my collar because it was soaking wet and I had a big berry, a navy blue berry on and... Uh, Navy blue uniform, collar and tie. A battery consisted of 400 personnel. He had uh, a mix of girls and men, more girls than men, funnily enough. The girls did um, the gun laying as they called it then. They were served as cooks and orderlies, clerks, driver mechanics, um, medical orderlies, that type of thing. And uh, the men were gunners. They actually fired the gun themselves. And their job was to protect um, the public as, as much as anybody, industry, um, airfields, all this sort of thing, from enemy attack. We girls, there were four girl drivers to a, a gun site, we did everything that needed moving, whatever it was. If it wanted moving, we moved it. Personnel, um, food, uh, ammunition, just anything that needed moving, we needed transport. We were the transport section. And uh, there'd be a group of 12 of us on the headquarters site. Uh, the trucks were old. We did all our own maintenance, uh, all our own um, repairs, under supervision, of course, with uh, trained um, mechanics, artificers. But sometimes, you know, if it was bitter cold weather and you were driving a truck that had no windscreens, no doors, <laughs> it wasn't fun and he could get a bit um, fed up and a bit cold. For a while we were in the Newcastle area, Sheffield, with all the steelworks and, and things like that, but we were in a ring around the city with the heavy guns. You couldn't have heavy guns in the middle of a, a steelworks and <laughs> because of shrapnel, for one thing, falling on the public. So you had a ring around a city of guns. So the aircraft flies into this zone just as the shell explodes and it's the shrapnel that does the damage, not the, the actual shell itself hitting the, the uh, aircraft. The girls were trained on radar so they would pick up uh, aircraft, incoming aircraft. Uh, they were trained in um, height finding, range finding. Uh, they set the fuses, worked out the fuses that were required. The um, elevation of the guns, quadrant, fuse, bearing, all these things were all worked out by the girls on instruments. Now, they were proved to be, the men didn't think we could do it, they didn't think the girls could do it, but they did. And they proved themselves not only to be as good as the men, but better. We arrived in this ploughed field. They'd put tents up for us. We didn't have the luxury of huts. And the men had got bell tents, First World War tents. The girls had got ridge tents, First World War. Both lots leaked. And then it was a case of four girls to a tent and balancing your bed on the furrows. Now that was tricky, getting one bed to stay level, but to get four in the one tent space. 
that it didn't tipple over when you sat on it uh, was quite a, a, a feat in itself. And we had one duck board to stand on so they weren't on wet grass. And if you didn't get that right and you stood on the end of it, the end would, other end would come up and hit you. He had a large box uh, with a hasp on and a, a padlock. That was to keep your kit in. There was a post in the middle of the tent with four nails in. That was to hang your great coat on. And that was it. To crown everything, there was no water laid on on the side. Now, bearing in mind, it 400 personnel. We had one pint of cold water allowed in the morning on a little dipper on a, a stick sort of thing. That was for your own personal use. That was for getting washed, washing your clothing, washing your hair, cleaning your teeth, all your personal requirements, one cold pint of water in the morning and one at night. That's all you were allowed. There was no water laid on in the site at all. No flush toilets, no showers, no baths. So just imagine what that was like. I was in the camp one day, in fact I was waiting for my uh, tanker, uh, tank to uh, discharge and uh, heard this aircraft, incoming aircraft, coming in very low and badly damaged and it looked all set for a crash on our camp. And I remember thinking, I don't, don't remember being frightened, I just remember thinking, I'm only 18 and I'm going to die. We could see the two pilots struggling to keep that aircraft in the sky. He'd lost most of his um, port wing. Both engines had gone on that side and there was just a stump of wing. The big tail had been uh, shot, there was a hole in the fuselage. And as he came over our camp, uh, one of his starboard engines packed up and he began to lose height. But there were some trees and he tried to get over these trees and he was almost at the end of the runway. But as he'd crossed our camp, we flung ourselves into the slit trenches. And I remember as I went down, looking up and all his Bombay doors were jammed open and all the bombs were hanging there in the racks. So those pilots must have known that immediately they touched ground, that aircraft would explode. Because they did get over us, but they didn't get over the trees and it just fell back on its tail. And there's a most enormous flash and bang. And then this black column of smoke just going up into a silent sky. That was it, 10 men gone. We were in within a couple of minutes of death that day. There'd have been 200, just over 200 of us, plus 10 of them. You know, I doubt there wouldn't have been any survivors, but they saved our lives that day. Well, how do you thank somebody sufficiently for saving your life? What do you say? You know, it, it would have been a kind of gratitude that it's hard to imagine.